Hi everyone. Today we are going to review another horrible case with you. Please support my channel, click on subscribe and on the bell. Popular wisdom says, if you want to lose a friend, lend him money. As a rule, when the time comes to repay this debt, there are hundreds of excuses and thousands of reasons not to do it. However, what to do if the amount is impressive and the money was not even borrowed but was given for safekeeping? But by the time it was necessary to return it, almost all the funds were spent? In such cases, it is not uncommon for the debtor to think of the most drastic and cruel ways of dealing with the problem. The case of Taylor Wright in 2017 shook up the quiet and cozy town of Pensacola, which is in the west of the sunny state of Florida, and became the subject of numerous detective documentaries and TV projects. The missing girl was searched for more than a month, but still found. There was no doubt about who took her life from that moment, although the killer, due to the specifics of his work, provided everything to leave no trace. But in an effort to create the illusion that the victim was still alive and had simply left town, one essential detail was missed, and it was this detail that ultimately solved this difficult case. Taylor Wright Early Years, Personal Life Taylor Harper Wright, before marriage Johnson, was born in 1994, April 23rd, in Jacksonville, North Carolina, and was the younger of two daughters in the family. She was a restless child from a young age, and parents, in order to direct the energy of the heiress in the right direction, decided to introduce her to sports. The girl was engaged in swimming, athletics, as well as oriental martial arts, where she achieved considerable success. After graduating from high school, Taylor entered a prestigious college and then became a student at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. This educational institution is considered the most selective and accepts less than half of those who apply for admission. However, the girl managed to get the necessary number of points. After receiving a diploma, she joined the police, becoming an officer in his native Jacksonville. In 2003, while still in college, when Taylor was 19 years old, she met a guy named Jeffrey Wright, with whom she had a romantic relationship. The young man was only a couple years older than her. They turned out to have a lot of common interests, so the romance developed rapidly. A year after meeting the couple decided to move in together and start living together. And two years later, the young man made his friend an official marriage proposal, to which she, of course, responded with consent. By 2009, the marriage of Taylor and Jeffrey gave a crack, but the couple naively believed that everything can still be fixed by the birth of a common child, which they have long thought about. So, in 2010, the couple had a son, but, contrary to expectations, the situation in the family did not improve, but only heated up even more. Young parents constantly quarreled and seemed to have completely ceased to find common ground. Nevertheless, their marriage lasted for almost five more years. In 2015, Jeffrey filed for divorce, indicating as a reason for adultery on the part of Taylor. She did not object, but the couple faced a long and difficult divorce process, as well as the main issue, custody of their common son, new love and loss of custody of the child. Almost immediately after the breakup with Jeffrey, Taylor took their son and moved to Pensacola, Florida, where she settled with her new passport, Cassandra Waller. Actually, the accusations of her husband in cheating were not unfounded, and Taylor had a romantic relationship on the side back in 2014. By that time, she had already left the service in the ranks of the police and became a private detective, which brought her much more income. Jeffrey's career was also going uphill, so that financially both parents could provide their son a decent life. Former spouses met exclusively in the courtroom, and all issues were solved only there. Even at the beginning of the divorce process, Taylor withdrew from their common account with her husband about $100,000 so as not to share this money and keep it. 
Part of the amount she transferred to her sister, part cashed out and gave to her parents, and almost half of the money she deposited with her former colleague and good friend named Ashley MacArthur. Jeffrey tried to challenge the actions of the former wife through the court, but the consideration of this claim was slowed down. And here, for custody of a small son, Wright unfolded a real war. The man accused his ex-wife that she took the heir to another state without his consent, as well as prevented their meetings and communication. In addition, Taylor behaved aggressively towards the ex-spouse. She yelled, scandalized, and even attacked him when he came to visit their son. In the middle of 2016, when Jeffrey once again came to pick up the child for the weekend, which, by the way, was prearranged, Taylor tried to forbid him to do so. First, she started swearing, using foul language. And when Jeffrey did put the boy in his car, Taylor started chasing them, nearly causing an accident. This dangerous behavior became a strong argument in court, and full custody of the child was given to the father. Embezzled other people's money. Taylor was strongly disagreed with the court's decision regarding custody of her son, and tried in every possible way to challenge the decision. She filed counterclaims, appeals, consulted with lawyers, and looked for a good lawyer who would represent her interests in this matter. But all of this required a lot of money, and she started spending what she had withdrawn from her and her ex-husband's joint account. It had been almost a year and a half since she had deposited about $40,000 with her close friend, Ashley MacArthur. She promised Taylor to put a cashier's check for the same amount in a safe deposit box, but in fact, forging a signature, simply transferred all the funds to her personal account, to which Wright did not have access. Ashley herself spent them at her own discretion, and when she was asked to return the money, they, in fact, no longer existed. After Taylor brought up the subject for the first time in a long time, MacArthur began to come up with various excuses and justifications for not going to the bank with her. She had health problems, she had a breakdown at work, and the bank supposedly had a glitch and needed to wait. But time passed, and Wright realized more and more clearly that the money was not going to be returned to her. At first, she tried to talk to Ashley, whom she had known for years and whom she had trusted to the letter. But Ashley kept making excuses and telling her to wait. After a few months, Taylor moved on to threats, promising to involve her connections from her past and current jobs. Taylor realized that threats would have little effect on MacArthur since she was married to a local sheriff's deputy. Eventually, Ashley called Wright on September 7th and suggested that they meet to go to the bank together and withdraw the money. Taylor agreed but immediately sensed a catch. They agreed to meet on the morning of September 8th, and the night before, Taylor decided to hang out with Cassandra in one of the local bars, and honestly confided her fears and doubts. She felt threatened by MacArthur, but Cassandra tried to reassure her that nothing terrible could happen. Mysterious disappearance or escape? On the morning of September 8th, while Taylor and Cassandra were having breakfast in their kitchen, Ashley drove up to the house in her car. Wright quickly got ready, said goodbye to Cassandra, and told her that she was going to work from the bank, so they wouldn't see each other until the evening. Waller had a strange, uneasy feeling that she couldn't find a logical explanation for. That day was the last time she would see Taylor alive. Taylor promised to call back and tell her how it went but it was already noon, and the girl remained silent. Then Cassandra decided to dial her number herself, but the calls kept getting rejected, and towards evening, Wright received a message from her phone saying that she needed to leave town for a few days to sort herself out. She also wrote that the money issue had been resolved and asked not to be disturbed for the time being. Waller found the whole situation very strange and disturbing. After failing to reach Taylor, she went to the police on September 9th to file a missing persons report. However, the law enforcers took a nonchalant attitude and considered the messenger messages 
as enough reason to consider Taylor alive and unharmed. They decided to delay the search for a few days and afterward extended it some more. The search for the missing person. It was not until September 14th, after the police were contacted by Wright's concerned parents and sister, who had been unable to contact her for almost a week, that Taylor was officially reported missing, and a large-scale search began. Taylor's loved ones unanimously stated that she could not just disappear like that. The girl too dear to her son, and on his call she would certainly answer. But the seven-year-old boy tried in vain to call his mom for more than a week. Moreover, almost all of the missing person's documents and personal belongings were left at home, and no transactions had been made on her credit cards since the evening of September 7th. Wright took nothing with her, and on September 9th, she stopped responding to messages, although she was still logged into her profile that day. However, Everyone had already guessed that someone else was writing from Taylor's phone. Police officers searched the house in which Wright lived with her new girlfriend. They made sure that all her documents were there, which meant she couldn't have traveled far. They also came across a permit to buy a gun, but the gun itself wasn't in the house. Cassandra explained that Taylor had purchased it for self-defense and had never used it before, but had taken it with her the day she disappeared. First Suspects Already in the first interrogations, Cassandra realized that law enforcers were trying to accuse her of Taylor's disappearance and were looking for evidence to prove it. However, she managed to confirm her alibi, because she had been at work since the morning, where she was seen by dozens of colleagues. After that, the detectives turned their attention to the ex-husband of the missing woman, with whom she had a very difficult relationship after the divorce. Jeffrey had a clear motive, because he and Taylor were still suing for custody of their son. In addition, the ex-spouse withdrew from their joint account an impressive amount, embezzling money to himself. But soon, this version fell apart, because the man was all the time in Jacksonville and did not leave the state of North Carolina. He took care of the child, went to work, and was always visible. It wasn't until afterward that police finally decided to talk to 41-year-old Ashley MacArthur, who Cassandra had been pointing out from the beginning. When she was finally called in for questioning, the lady was acting very strange and defiant. She was in high spirits, flirting with the officers, and didn't seem at all bothered by the situation. According to Ashley, she gave Taylor the full amount that day, after which they went for a little drive around town and then said goodbye. She also added that Wright looked upset and planned to leave town for a couple days to sort things out. She hasn't seen her again since that day, or even contacted her on the phone. Still, Ashley figured that nothing bad could happen to Wright because she was a martial artist, physically strong, and carried a gun with her at all times. There was no evidence against MacArthur, so she was released after questioning. Nevertheless, the suspect's behavior and story raised a lot of questions. The police decided to take a closer look at the woman and found out that she had worked as a forensic technician for a long time and had visited numerous crime scenes to help collect evidence. She was keenly aware of what mistakes to avoid to avoid leaving a trail and what evidence detectives would look for first. In addition, the data from the cell phone carrier showed that the women had been calling and texting constantly for the past couple of months, and judging by the nature of their communication, Ashley wasn't going to pay back the debt, and Taylor was very worried about that. Another oddity was that MacArthur, after the interrogation, began to call the station every day to inquire about the progress of the investigation. She herself claimed to be worried about her friend, but the police realized that she just wanted to make sure that the detectives were not on her trail. New questionable details. About a week after the first interview, the cops decided to talk to Ashley again. This time, she did not look so cheerful and carefree, as she realized that she was taken thoroughly the woman tried to put the blame on the ex-husband of the missing woman, but when she learned that he had been removed from the list of suspects, 
she changed her tactics. She claimed that Jeffrey could have hired someone to kill Taylor, and allegedly, Taylor knew about it and feared for her life, and therefore carried a gun. In addition, MacArthur allegedly recalled new details that seemed very inconclusive to detectives. She claimed that Wright was very upset that day, so they went together to the Ashley family farm to ride horses and unwind a bit. In the process, Taylor allegedly admitted that she was losing her nerve and was planning to travel to another city to purchase illegal substances, as regular medications were not helping her fight the stress she developed from her problems with her ex-husband. When asked why she did not report it immediately, MacArthur said she did not want her friend to get into trouble. Nevertheless, despite the lack of solid evidence, she remained the main suspect because she had a clear motive not to return a large sum of money. And the transaction itself was not documented, so Ashley could claim that long ago gave all the money. A new twist in the case. The police decided to trace the route of the women on the day of the disappearance of Wright on the signal of their cell phones and found that it doesn't coincide with the one that Ashley voiced. It turned out that they had not gone to the horse farm owned by the MacArthur family, but somewhere much farther out of town. Then, the suspect's cell phone signal suddenly disappeared as she had probably turned it off. A few hours later, a message came from Taylor's phone saying she needed to leave and sort herself out, and soon the signal from that device disappeared as well. But on the morning of September 8th, Ashley's gadget was back on, already in Pensacola. The suspect probably feared that their phones would be recorded together, and therefore turned off her cell phone for a while. When asked directly about it, Ashley said her smartphone simply ran out of battery, but soon it was possible to determine the geolocation from where the last messages were sent on behalf of Taylor. The location turned out to be a long, vacant house with a plot of land belonging to MacArthur's parents, which she had forgotten to mention. Detectives got a search warrant that same day and went there. Concreted corpse. At first glance, there was nothing unusual about the vacant country house. The structure and the surrounding area looked abandoned, but the backyard had a suspiciously fresh bed of flowers that appeared to have been planted there recently, and the ground beneath them was still loose. The cops decided to check the strange flower bed, but after digging a couple times with a shovel, they hit something hard. The obstacle turned out to be a rectangular-shaped layer of concrete, which had obviously been used to fill a shallow hole. But the most gruesome discovery awaited law enforcement when the slab was removed, and inside it they found the skeleton of a woman with a bullet hole in the back of her head. The body of missing Wright was identified almost immediately from her dental records, but the cause of death, due to severe decomposition, could not be accurately determined. But since no other obvious injuries were found, it was assumed that she had been shot in the head. However, there was also a blunt force trace on her skull, but it was not fatal. On October 17th, Ashley was arrested, and her home was thoroughly searched, during which a bank check with Wright's forged signature was found. Ashley had used it to wire money to Taylor Wright's personal account, and spent it as she saw fit. When the suspect was presented with this document, she became visibly nervous, began to change her statement, and tried to convince investigators that she had returned the money in cash from her own savings, the murder weapon and reconstructing the timeline. Ashley and her husband Zachary had several firearms at home, but none of them matched the one that fired the bullet into the back of Wright's head. However, a revolver that belonged to the murdered woman and had been with her on the day she disappeared was soon found in an abandoned outbuildings on the property where the body was found. Ballistics testing confirmed that it was the weapon that had been used to shoot the deceased. MacArthur categorically denied involvement, but became increasingly confused in her testimony. She claimed she was being framed, accusing Taylor's ex-husband or current girlfriend. She said the body had been hidden on purpose on her family property, which had not been visited in years 
and the murder weapon had been left there. Due to the fact that the suspect refused to admit her guilt and cooperate with the investigation, the chronology of events of that fateful day was restored very roughly. So in the morning, Ashley herself came to pick up the victim, already knowing that she would take her life, and Taylor, suspecting something wrong, took a gun with her. Judging by the cell phone signal, the women did indeed drive around the city for a while, and apparently during that time the killer lured the victim to a country house, convincing her that she would give her the money there. Once there, Ashley likely stunned Taylor with a blow to the head, and while she was disoriented, shot her in the back of the head with her own gun. The next day, on September 9th, MacArthur was caught on surveillance cameras at the Home Depot hardware store where she was buying concrete as well as soil for flowers. Trial and conviction. The defendant's lawyers insisted that all the evidence found was circumstantial and no direct evidence was found linking their client to the murder. In addition, the woman must have had accomplices as it would have been very problematic for her to dispose of the body and cover her tracks alone. Ashley's husband became a suspect and was also arrested. During the investigation, it turned out that MacArthur had a young lover, a certain Brandon Beatty, with whom she'd been dating for several years. Actually, the embezzled money that belonged to Wright, she spent back in the spring of 2017, on the purchase of a small yacht for her favorite. When the defendant's husband learned about it, he agreed to testify against her and admitted that Ashley is obsessed with money and could well go to the crime for such a large sum. A key witness was soon found, a barmaid at a local club named Audrey Warren. She said that Ashley was a frequent guest of the establishment where she worked, and they were always chatting. In a state of alcoholic intoxication, MacArthur became very talkative, and therefore Audrey knew about the presence of her lover and about her conflict with Taylor. In recent months, according to Warren, Ashley was constantly talking about how the world would be cleaner if Taylor suddenly died. She also went over various ways to eliminate the woman. In particular, she claimed she could easily give her an overdose by putting illegal substances in her beer, and no one would ever prove her guilty. During the investigation, financial fraud involving MacArthur also surfaced. As it turned out, she had her own business of installing various slot machines, and the proceeds from them were to be divided in half between Ashley and her clients. However, the greedy woman was pocketing about 75% of the profits. When the scandal broke out, she invited her clients to her office where the documents were kept in order to prove her innocence. But during the night, a fire mysteriously broke out in the building, destroying the entire bookkeeping. Experts found clear signs of arson, and MacArthur immediately blamed the disgruntled partners for everything and filed a lawsuit. In August 2019, the defendant was found guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of qualifying for parole after no more than 25 years. She was also additionally sentenced to seven years in prison for financial fraud and office arson. Thanks for watching, guys. Subscribe to my channel. There are many shocking stories ahead of you.